morning. My name is Steve Self. I go to Christopher's Home Church and also go to college with him. When he called me and asked me to read scripture in a church that I'd never been to before, it took me all of about a second and a half to say yes. Because I absolutely love sharing the written word of God with people. Because I believe it changes lives. The words in this book actually change people's lives daily. Absolutely amazing. But I also love the ability to get to come to another church and worship with another body of believers. Because we're all brothers and sisters in Christ, and I absolutely love getting around and meeting more of you. It's absolutely awesome to me. Uh, the scripture reading this morning is Philippians 1, 20-26. And if you would, go ahead and turn with me and uh, read along with me. It's kind of about most of the way through the book. It's actually about halfway through uh, in the New Testament. Philippians 1, 20-26. I eagerly expect and hope that I in no way will be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage, so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean a fruitful labor for me. Yet, what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire... To depart and be with Christ, which is better by far, but it is more necessary for me, uh, it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and I will continue with you, <clears throat> excuse me, I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith, so that through my being with you again, your joy in Christ Jesus will overflow on account of me. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we praise and we thank you so much for this morning. We praise and thank you so much for the word that you've given us in the Bible. Father, we pray that you be with Christopher as he delivers your word to us. And we pray that you open our hearts and our minds to receive what you have in store for us. For it's in your son's most holy name. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Just imagine you've been a Christian all your life was baptized at an early age, go to church every Sunday, even teach a Sunday school class. Then one day you're cruising down the road in your new BMW, you're going about 80 miles per hour, and an 18-wheeler comes around the corner making a big turn and slams right into you head on. You see your car disintegrate in front of, your, in front of you, and then you black out. When you open your eyes, you're standing in a courtroom. You have no consistency at all. You can put your hand right through your body. A giant screen comes down to your left, and a film starts showing your life story and every sin you committed as everyone that lived before you watched. <clears throat> then the judge comes out. It's God himself. He asks, is there any defense for this person? You turn around and see a man stand up behind you. He says, there is none. I do not know this person, for they did not truly believe in me or my father. That was Jesus that just said he did not know you. God stands up and says, so be it. He opens up the book of life, flips some pages and says, your name is nowhere to be found. You are sentenced to eternity in hell. <clears throat> then you disappear to find yourself in the most terrible agony. You pinch yourself and you wake up in a hospital room with only cuts and bruises. There'd be a million questions going through your mind at a time like this. You would be wondering, was that real? Is God trying to tell me something? What just happened? I wonder if my beamer's all right. Did I really ever accept Jesus, or was it just a game I played? What do I do now? That's the big question. You've got to decide if you really believe in God, or are you just playing around? Do you believe that he created the earth? Do you believe that he really gave his son to die for you on the cross to forgive you your sins? Do you believe wholeheartedly that God created you uniquely and for a purpose? <coughs> Do you believe the Bible is inspired by God and is accurate? What about Adam and Eve? Are they my ancestors? <clears throat> These are just a few of the things I'll be talking about today. The question I'm about to ask you is a simple question. It doesn't have a trick answer. Just answer it, just answer it truthfully to yourself. If you see a house, is it logical to assume that a house was built by a man or that it just happened to appear there? Hebrews chapter 3 verse 4 says, For every house is built by someone, 
but God is the builder of everything. Now, if a house has a builder, is it log logical to assume that a universe must also have a builder? The Bible says God created all things, Adam and Eve, the whole universe, and he did it in six days. But is that what you truly believe? They teach in school and on the Discovery Channel the theory of evolution. Most people accept it too these days, Christian, excuse me, without giving it much thought, Christians included. We think on one side, God created the universe like the Bible says, but it is billions of years old like the textbooks say. Adult Christians and children sometimes get pulled into a type of belief like this without even knowing it. It's called theistic evolution. The dictionary definition for this is a modified form of evolutionary hypothesis which attempts to reconcile the Bible with evolution. And this cannot be done truthfully. The first chapter of Genesis has 18 different subjects that disprove the theory of evolution, if you believe in the Bible. Some Mormon churches believe in a form of this today. For those who don't know what evolution is, let me explain briefly. It is a very slow, gradual process where a lesser species turns into a better species over a long period of time like a frog to a chicken, then a chicken to a monkey, and then later turning into a human being. The theory of evolution teaches that the Earth is billions of years old, and it took mankind billions of years just to look like we do now. Excuse me, it took uh, billions of years just to, us, just to us to have a humanoid shape. Then it took millions more years for us to evolve into the kind of person we look like now, according to evolution. They say the universe in the earth is billions of years old, and that a long time ago, a bunch of dust that they say came from nowhere, bunched or squished themselves together to have some kind of big party. Then after they squished themselves, they decided to, into a dot. They, excuse me, they squished themselves into the size of a dot, smaller than a period in one of those Bibles. And then after that, they decided to start spinning. And it says they spun, and they spun, and they spun, till they blew up. Hence the Big Bang. And this created all the planets, stars, moons, galaxies that we see today. Then on this planet Earth, the rock slowly broke down over billions of years to become bacteria that spawned with other bacteria of its same kind to form an animal. They speculated as a water animal of some kind, like a fish or a frog of sorts, because they don't have any proof. They have to be, this has to be relied on by faith. Their main belief is that we came from a rock. That came from the Big Bang dust. That came from nowhere. The possibility of the kind of bacteria that they say that it would take to evolve into a human being like us is a one and a one with a 100 trillion zeros behind it. Chance. Which, according to science, is impossible. And that's what the theory of evolution is. Now I'm going to tell you what the Bible says about the Earth and how it was created. The Bible says the earth, the universe, and all the animals and people were created in six days, no more, no less. Did you know the Bible has an accurate timeline from Adam to Christ? It gives us how long each person lived, how old they were when their children were born, how many they had, and how long they had lived when they died. It gives the bloodline of the Israelites or the Jews all the way from Adam through Abraham, Joseph, David, all the way to Jesus through the Old Testament and into the New Testament when Jesus was born. Christian scientists have actually taken the Bible and calculated these timelines up. They say from the time Adam was born till he was created, to the beginning of the earth, to the time Jesus was born, according to the Bible, there was a 4,000 year period, not billions or millions. That would mean... And then you add on the approximately 2,000 years since Jesus was born, and you have around 6,000 years old. And that's how old the Bible says the earth is, 6,000 years old. That would mean, according to this timeline, the flood happens, the great flood with Noah, happened around 4,400 years ago, 400 years before Abraham was born, about 2,400 B.C. How old do you think the oldest tree on earth could be if the earth was billions of years old? When the flood came, it changed the whole ecosystem and devastated the surface of the earth. 
according to the Bible's timeline, 2400 B.C. or 4400 years ago. Well, how old would you say the oldest tree would be if the Bible was correct? Did you know the oldest tree on earth is only 4300 years old? A hundred years younger than when the flood happened? You would think if the earth was as old as evolution says, there would be an older tree. Does anyone know what a caterpillar is? It's a long fishing pole-like contraption with a small motor at the back, and it has a kind of a fork on the end, and a rope runs from the motor all the way up into the fork. It is sometimes used when a cow has a hard time giving birth to a calf. You would take the calf's legs and tie them to this machine as it pumps air into itself, yanking the calf out with two tons of pressure. Well, one day a farmer was out pulling a calf. It was a breached birth. That means the hind legs were coming out first and he was using this machine. A city slicker was driving by when he saw this thing going on, so he stopped his car and went to the side of the fence to see what in the world was going on. The farmer says, I need some help. The city slicker said, I don't know nothing about cows. The farmer said, would you please come and help me? So the city slicker jumped the fence and ran to help the farmer pull the cow. He never said a word, just did what he was told. Well, about 10 minutes later, the calf was out fine, and they were walking up to the barn to get washed up. The farmer said, have you ever seen anything like this before? The city guy replied, no, I've never seen anything like this in my entire life. The farmer said, well, you got any questions? The city fellow said, well, yes, sir, I have one question that's bugging me for the last 10 minutes. The farmer said, well, what is it? The city slicker replied, um... How fast do you suppose that little cow was going when it ran into the back of that bigger cow? How fast was the little cow going when it ran into the back of the bigger cow? Two people seeing the same thing and one getting the wrong idea. The same thing happens between Christians and evolutionists all the time. They see the same thing and have two different ideas. One believes in the Bible, the other believes in the theory of evolution. And most of them are about the flood. When the flood waters receded, they went pretty fast, picking up any loose dirt or gravel, rocks, and changing the whole surface of the earth. If you take a Bible-believing Christian and an evolutionist to the Grand Canyon, the evolutionist will walk up to the ledge and say, Wow, look what the Colorado did for billions and billions of years. The Bible-believing Christian will walk up to the ledge and say, Wow, look what the flood did in about 30 minutes. How was that canyon made anyway? Was it a little bit of water or a whole lot of time? or a whole bunch of water in a little bit of time. How fast was that calf going anyway? It's just a matter of how you look at things. Often there are two different ways. The Great Flood is the next subject. Some of y'all that live in Houston will say it was last summer, but we're talking about a flood that covered the, everything on the face of the earth by many miles, including the mountains of Everest. Genesis chapter 1, 6 through 8 says, And God said, Let there be an expanse between the waters, to separate water from water. So God made the expanse and separated the water under the expanse from the water above it, and it was so. God called the expanse sky, and there was evening and there was morning, the second day. Like it was just said, this was the second day, and all the earth was was a big ball of water. And God said, he separated the water from the water, and he put an expanse, which was called sky, between it, leaving a big ball of water, which was going to be the earth, and a layer of water hundreds of miles thick above the earth. And a lot of people would say, well, this is just the atmosphere. Well, the atmosphere is actually made up of several different kinds of gases, not water. God talks about the same layer and refers to the flood in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 3-6 through 6, as it refers to the flood. You can read along with me if you'd like. First of all, you must understand, in the last days there will be scoffers. They will come scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, Where is this coming, he promised? Ever since our fathers died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. But they deliberately forgot that a long time ago, by God's word, the heavens existed, and the earth was formed out of the water and by the water. By these same waters, the earth of that time was deluged and destroyed. Here it's talking about people that will deliberately ignore the flood to pursue their own evil desires or to promote themselves in the world or to make themselves look better. It also says about the earth being formed out of the water and by the waters, like we were talking about a minute ago. And by the water above the earth, the earth was flooded. We see here that there was a layer of water above the earth before the flood and that God thought 
caused him to flood the earth. But why did he have that layer of water up there anyway? Does it serve any purpose? Did you know the oxygen content in the air we breathe is only 20% and the rest is made up of other kinds of gases? With that layer of water up there, the oxygen content in the air we breathe will be 30%, making our heartbeat slower and our blood a lot richer in oxygen. Excuse me. We would heal faster and breathe slower. Our blood would be so rich with oxygen as it goes through our heart. Our, blood would, our heart would be getting so much oxygen that we would breathe only a few times per minute. But what else does it do, though? X-rays, which come from the sun, shoot out at the earth and go right through it. Well, as they go through, they are also passing through our bodies, creating tiny microscopic holes our body has to constantly repair. Years and years of this will break down our bodies quite fast. Do you remember before the flood, people lived sometimes ten times longer than, they, than we do now? Well, x-rays cannot travel through thick bodies of water. The water will be reflecting these harmful rays away from the earth. Our bodies will be working a lot better than they do now. We will be four times as healthy as the healthiest person on earth. But once God collapsed in that layer of water to flood the earth, people started living very short of life than they do now. Do you remember when you go to the dentist and you get an x-ray, they put that big metal vest over your chest. It's to uh, stop the x-rays which they're shooting into your mouth to stop from going into your chest. Because those x-rays shoot right through you to develop the uh, certain kind of film they have on the other side. Those x-rays are very, very harmful to your body. Your body has to constantly repair them. Uh, that's why you have wrinkles after so many years, because it takes certain chemicals out of your skin. Well, the Bible itself, people have sometimes doubts with. Uh, did you know it was written by 40 different authors over a period of 1,500 years? In 40 different generations? Excuse me. In different places? In different times? In three different continents? In three different languages? Hundreds of different subjects it covers, with thousands of historical facts. And it's unique in its survival, unique in its teachings, and unique in its influence it has had on people. And with all of this, there is not one indiscrepancy or anything that conflicts with each other in the whole Bible. I say it's unique in its survival because how many books do you know have lasted this long and are still a top seller till this day? It's gone through numbers of translations from language to language, from version to version, just to get to the point it is in front of you. Did you know that years ago they found these things called the Dead Sea Scrolls, which was the book of Hebrews? These scrolls in the NIV version translated word for word, just as, they, just as if it had just been copied down and translated into English. You will understand how these things get twisted or turned around if you ever play the telephone game. What you do is you sit in a circle, and the person starts by saying a phrase. Something really simple like the blue dog jumped over the brown fence. And the person beside them, they tell it to the person beside them, and it goes all the way around the circle. And as it goes around the circle, people will forget to say words or will pronounce it wrong. And when it gets back to the start, it'll be totally different than what it started as. Well, God created science, and science is not bad at all. And the Bible is jam-packed full of it. We see the verses that say, just to look around you, and that's the proof that God exists. <coughs> Well, when we study the Bible as a whole, we will understand this verse more completely. Did you know that Job was one of the very first astronomers? Or that Moses built the best irrigation system still known to the modern man? It was to drain the excess water from the land, or to water their crops. When all the countries around them were having, excuse me, the black plague or diseases, they were doing fine because they didn't have the stale, stagnant water sitting around with bacteria and growing mosquitoes. The Bible also has medical information in it. The guy gave his people several different things to do before even delivering a baby or between deliveries. He said not to drink the blood of animals. We know today the number of germs and illnesses that are in the blood that are harmful to us. Things in the Bible that God commanded the Israelites or the Jews to do will, not, will start now making sense to us. Did you know not up, up until the 1900s the death rate for mothers giving birth was almost 50%? The doctors between births would not even wash their hands. They have the blood of one birth and go to the next one without even washing their hands and contaminate and spread the germs. God
God commanded these things for the Israelites to do in the Bible thousands of years ago in the Old Covenant. These two things I've mentioned don't even compare to the amount of information in the Bible. There's history that's been found more factual and more complete than the records from the Egyptian kings or the Romans. We read the Bible, but just as a history book sometimes. It's a whole handbook to life. It has counseling. It's a science book. It's got art, music, sports, humor, love. Anything you can think of, God has given you the instructions for in the Bible. The Apostle Paul, if you go back and read his letters, you'll notice that he had a sense of humor. You might be saying, hold on a minute. The Apostle Paul had a sense of humor? Paul in his letters would speak sarcastically to the Jewish officials sometimes, and even to the fake apostles that went around asking if they served the Lord. He wasn't rude to them, but he made his point across. He used subjects to illustrations people could relate to. When he was speaking to the Greeks, he used sports two or three times in his letters, because that's what interests them. I encourage you to go and read for yourself and dig deep in the Bible and study it, and you'll discover so many new things that you had never noticed before. With all the information here and all the points I've made, I only scratch the surface of the amount of information in the Bible. But out of it all, it's just to lead up to one thing, the only thing that really matters, which is the more, most important thing before all the rest. You must believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that he came to earth as a mortal man, that he was crucified and he died for you, and that three days later he arose from the dead. He came and died, but all you must do is believe. If you believe and decide to give your life over to God, accept his Son into your heart as your Lord and Savior. Be baptized and let the Holy Spirit in. Then when is your day to go to judgment? Maybe it will come out a little bit like this. You find yourself standing in that courtroom waiting for judgment. The screen comes down and show, to show your sins, but nothing comes on or starts. God comes out as the judge as before and says, Is there any defense for this witness? Uh, excuse me, for this person. Christ stands up behind you and says, Yes, there is, but there is no need for one. I bring before you the book of life as evidence. As they open it, immediately your name is found. And in the blink of an eye, you disappear and find yourself in the most wonderful place that you could ever have imagined. In the verse read earlier by Steve, Paul was in almost constant persecution, and he said, To live is Christ and to die is gain. Paul was in conflict with himself. He wanted to stay on earth, so he could visit the people he was writing and continue spreading the, uh, excuse me, continue spreading the gospel and working for Christ. But he knew he would also have to deal with the pressure of the people wanting to constantly kill him and trying to kill him. But he knew that if he died, he would get to go up and be with God finally and talk with Jesus. He knew that it wasn't his time to leave yet and that his work was not complete. So he put his faith in God and trusted that he would protect him until his time came. Paul was just a regular guy. But without him, the Gentiles, us, would have might never heard the gospel. He at one time was one of the biggest supporters for killing those who believed in Jesus. He was there when Stephen was stoned, and he was on the road to a place called Damascus to arrest a bunch of Christians when God changed his whole life around. God set before him a new road for him to travel down in his life. Christ knew Paul's abilities and what Paul could do to help him in his work at spreading the gospel. Just like Paul, God has a plan for you. He made you uniquely and for a purpose. He has a special plan for you, and the road has been set before you to start on that path today. Before you can start to save others from going to hell, you must first save yourself. Before you can... Where would you rather spend eternity, in heaven or in hell? Do you feel like God is calling you today to accept him and receive his love? Or have you been feeling that nagging on your heart? If you do, I urge you to come forward as we sing and accept Jesus as your